Well, hey, this is another wrap up to the Collab Talk Tweet Jam here, March 2020. And the topic today was developing strategy for digital literacy. And joining me is Tracy. Tracy, hello. How's it, Christian? Um, thanks, thanks for nice staying up. out. Well, it's not that late. I mean, yeah. I'm getting old, <laughs> but it's, it's quarter past seven, so it's not that late yet. Not too bad. Um, no. But I, but I know this is so. This uh, we were just chatting about. So this topic actually came from conversations. I know this is your your passion. You talk on, you present on this topic of digital literacy, and we had talked about this. I think it scheduled this back in late December. Um, these tweet guns. I try to plan out the topics if, in, in advance, um, and uh, and so the the results of today we had great interaction, uh, strong it turnout. I was great. I mean, it's look, it's busy. That tweet jam gets busy. Okay, you kind of like start reading something and it just runs. So yeah, I definitely I, I want to take some, and I like. In the middle of it, I thought, why did I not go write to Power Automate to like put this into a list for me so that I can work through it slower? But ugh, anyway. Yeah. But, well, uh, I, the, the nice thing too about Tygraphs, their sponsorship, not only did oh, they provide the stats, but on the last page of their Power BI report um, is every single tweet. Oh, that's brilliant. Of yeah. course. That's so brilliant. you can, so anybody that wants to go do that, and I'll share the, have the link and stuff that, uh, you know, with the description here of the video. Yeah. Um, but anybody that wants to go and read through at their own pace every thread, because it can be yeah. overwhelming to some people that aren't used to that. Yeah, there's a there's a lot that I just didn't get to commenting on, and I mean, as uh, as you said, I'm super passionate about this, so I'd love to go see um, the opinion of my peers, you know, and the people that I work with every day as well, and then I see at the conferences because um, it's been an interesting topic for many years for me, and and the opinions have definitely changed. And I definitely think that this COVID thing has uh, put more focus on yeah. it as well. Yeah, and we're, that was one of the questions, and we'll come back to that. And I will say for anybody that uh, if you missed the live tweet jams, these are a monthly activity. They've been going for uh, since January of 2012. And I was thinking yesterday, I think in all those years, I think we've only missed maybe three or four months. So it's been very consistent. And right. uh, what's great about Twitter is a platform for this is that anybody could get involved with these. Mm -hmm. And after the fact, and I, in fact, I saw somebody that retweeted uh, a comment that I made in a tweet jam like a year ago. Okay. And, and so I responded to their retweet. Um, this was like yesterday or two days ago. Yes. Um, and uh, so it's, it's great to see that. So you can go at after the fact, read through the questions and respond. And Tygraph is still, for the next 24 hours or so, they're still capturing all that data and they apply to the staff. Well, that's, so. that's good to know because yes. I wouldn't mind uh, pouring myself a glass of wine after this and, uh, and actually just taking a moment and scrolling through there. I'm just so curious to see what everyone's had to say. Yeah, please do so. Well, let's jump in. So question number one was, how does your organization define digital literacy and what does it mean to you personally? Are you asking me that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot as we go through cutting your thoughts on each spot? one of these. Yeah, that's all good. So, so firstly, um, remember that my organisation just consists of me and a sheep called Brom. So, um, so my reference would be the clients that I'm uh, working with and that I am helping um, with us. So the the way that I've approached this for many years, because PC literacy used to be something that's very well known and assumed that everyone is PC literate. But for me, digital literacy has always been that little bit of extra and how technology has evolved um, has added more to that. But then, um, and I did share that somewhere in, uh, in the tweet jam, that um, the eight pillars of digital literacy, and I know that me and you are very aligned on those, uh, those methodologies that we use. Um, so the eight pillars is something that I've aligned to, which, which I suppose is considered soft skills. And I think we need to like just vote and have that renamed. But Yeah, that but, doesn't make sense anymore. No, it doesn't at all. But I mean, that just, uh, that talks about not just the technology, because I think PC literacy tends to talk about this, the technology side of it, where digital literacy, I think, is more applying that skill with technology and um, achieving more. So collaboration, creation of content, curation of content, creativity, et cetera. So I think the ones that are the, the physical skill and the one is the application of it um, and being more efficient at it. I know that, so we had, uh, so Melissa Sassy joining from IBM as well. And so she shared a link uh, 
to the methodology that she uses. I didn't have a chance to go take yeah. a look at it yet, but uh, I know, want to look at it. Yeah, so I, I mean, and there are a lot of tools that are out there. So for even for organizations that uh, are are beginning to think about this, look, there are tons of resources that are out there. But I would say start with following Tracy, follow uh, Melissa. Um, Shadid is another great person, Mr. Shadid on Twitter, uh, another great person who, uh, you know, the, this, this topic is just kind of built into the work that he does uh, within his community as well, um, there in the Baltimore area. Um, so, so great to take a look at. Um, question two was, what level of education and training does your organization provide today and what have been the outcomes? So again, you and I are both independents, our little businesses. Yeah of one or yours is 1.5 if you include Brahm. Uh, mm. But- um, Brahm probably brings up the digital literacy of my company. <laughs> <laughs> By 75%, yes. Uh, so I mean, but with the clients that we work with most actively, um, I, you know, and of course we both have had this past experiences, past organizations. Um, so what is kind of the norm that you see in organizations for what they provide? I think first I'll answer this from um, from customers that I've not dealt with. So I definitely don't want to say they don't have anything when I've already started dealing with them because then they obviously have something in place. But uh, my engagement normally with new customers and what I see out in the market is that there isn't much of that that exists. They just don't, uh, they're not focusing on um, on that level of education or uh, literacy it's, uh, it's also, it's, it's just way up. They, they kind of start with things like developing things in SharePoint and deploying teams. And it's always been a technical focus. So that bottom layer has just always been missing in companies. And I think it's because we assume, we just assume that all users know and they just don't train them. I mean, I've had a CIO tell me that everyone in his company is PC literate. And I said that I would love to do a case study with them. I want to know how they... Yeah. Uh, measure yeah. that. How do they know they that? Right. The skills are, yeah. and uh, and they said to me that um, that there's a form that you fill in when you apply for a job at that company, and there's a tick box that says you've got to be PC literate. And I'm like, yeah, there yeah. You go. yeah. That's like a job yeah. to metrics. It's like, oh, they've logged in this month. They've adopted. You know. Yeah. So I, I don't think so. Apart from companies that uh, I think, like I can't say it's everyone, but a lot of companies that I come across and year of and deal with. Um, is just not focusing on that and they're making mistakes because of it, but they are waking up to it. So so a lot of companies that's uh, taken on uh, moving to Office 365 or cloud technologies suddenly realize that there's something missing in the magic pudding. You know, they, they kind of tried it now for two or three years. It normally kicks in after two years and they say, you know, we've got consumption, but we don't understand what's going wrong, you know, and then that's when I kind of get involved. So I don't think it's where it should be, but I definitely think that this... Um, this opportunity for improvement that we're finding ourselves in at the moment is going to change that. Well, it needs to have an impact on the culture. And the first thing I thought of with this question, I, so I've experienced uh, with two companies uh, very experienced this specific issue where we had uh, monthly or quarterly um, hours that we were uh, you know, given as employees for training and and to go yeah. and and basically like you know, go sign up for classes through uh, the, the the you know employee education program, and yet mm -hmm. there was a cultural penalty through managers and how it was viewed if you utilized those resources. So they were set aside. It was in our commitments. And yet if we use yeah. them, it's like, why are you wasting time? We got so much going yeah. on. It was, you know, so culturally there, you know, it was looked down upon yeah. if you went and utilized those credits. No, anyway. I, I mean, I, I think you're incredibly fortunate to have been in a company where that was even made available, but um, a lot of companies don't have that. Um, companies again are waking up to the growth mindset and uh, saying that people should go for it. I think a challenge with that though is, is that if you make those things available, a lot of people just won't do it. So that is where why, and I know a lot of people get upset to me, but that's why I believe that certain levels of training should be compulsory and I just don't take no for an answer. Yeah. Companies sometimes say, no, no trace, we're not going to do it like that. And then a year later they'll say, okay, let's revisit that. We think we need to do that. So, so that's a challenge. People don't know that they need the training, so they won't go for it. And that's why campaigns are important. 
But then also, if, uh, if we look at that, if we say what are they providing today and what are the positive outcomes if they do provide it. So if I then look at the other side of the coin, companies that I have been dealing with where we've built these programs in, um, I think we're we just getting like unbelievable Office 365 adoption when we fix the basics first. And, and a silly example. So how many people have come to you? And I'm talking like really, I've got to like be careful because Vesa did this the other day in a call with me where he called people like me normal people as opposed to developers. And I nearly just did that. <laughs> so I don't want to say all, normal we people. We all know there's a right. bit of truth there though. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're right. We are the normal people. But um, so let's take uh, let's let's take people that are not focused on technology. Okay, um, it tends to be a pain to just get involved. In it. So they start using Teams, and how many of those people complain that they can't find their stuff again? We hear it all the time. It's so messy. I can't find my stuff. There's too, just too much of it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So Teams gets blamed for it. I mean, I saw one of the tweets. Someone said something about uh, digital literacy puts focus on the issues we have with UX, and I don't agree with that at all. I don't think it's got anything to do with UX. But um, the, the thing is, imagine that user had gone through basic training where they were taught to search better. Um, then they wouldn't have that problem in Teams. So the problem they're experiencing in Microsoft Teams has actually got nothing to do with Microsoft Teams. It's because they don't have the basic skill that a lot of us has overdeveloped over the years. I mean, most users are still not searching. Right. They're navigating. Well, that, and we're rolling out technology. That's why I passed that. I, I think that's a good segue into question three, which is what do you consider the most effective training mediums and why? Um, because so I, right, go ahead. yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I think right now um, things have changed. Okay, so so there's preferred methods, and then there's we're going to do right now what we can do right now until we can do other things. Okay, when I get involved in companies, they normally to either save money. Or to do it faster, they ask me to rather like go straight in there and rather deliver much bigger groups online training. Okay, so um, and then record it so people can watch it afterwards, and I'm like, you're wasting your time. Someone who's not digitally literate or not efficient or not comfortable with technology does not go and watch a video afterwards. They just they're too afraid of technology and they don't even know it. I mean, this is something that they don't even realize they're afraid of because we have for years put people in little boxes. For years, so let's say I'm the normal person and you're the developer, right? So you're the IT person. So for years in the company, I'm seen as, no, no, I'm not IT. I don't get those things. You know, I just, uh, I capture invoices or I manage the HR or the payroll or something. And uh, no, no, I'm not an IT person. So for years, we've put people in boxes like that. And sadly, for years, IT has put people in boxes like that and made them feel um whatever okay inadequate so so now those people have this little bolt-in in the background they don't even realize that they are resistant towards tech so now you're giving them tech to train them that doesn't work so it's like imagine this imagine going for for like um for therapy okay and they they send you a link you know they send you and your wife or you and your kids or whatever with therapy we need they send you a link with an online video to watch i mean how much do you think that's going to work so, so tech therapy is exactly the same to, to fix that thing that's broken right in the beginning. And I'm talking about way before I get to Office 365. I'm talking about Windows and basic productivity. That's therapy. For me, it's not normal training. And there's a, there's a way that you've got to deal with people to break down that fear they have of technology. And after that, I can send them any link and they'll watch a video. Well, I, you so know, just I, I, I made the comment. Therapy. I, I made the comment, I think, which backs this up too, that about um, you know, when you th talk about digital transformation of an organization, whatever that big, the overused term means. No. But I, I, I look at that as, you know, so fundamentally, people need to understand, it's not about the technology specifically, but it is about, yeah. um, it's about going in and, and understanding your role and what the business need is. And it's a combination of people, process, and technology to do more, yeah. to, to, to be more. And, and so there's plenty of people that will go in and be like, and train up on whatever the latest features are without ever making the connection with, okay, now how do I do more, create more, move this faster, collaborate better? How does this actually change the way that I work and improve the yeah. overall business? And so I think more yeah. thought needs to be given to that and it needs to be better explained to the technical or non-technical of here's what we're doing, here's how it changes the culture of the organization, 
our roles and responsibilities, uh, the, the, the business processes that we own, and again, can be very non-technical, but involve basic things. I mean, if you think of even the incremental improvements to the office suite of productivity tools, there's so many cool little features there that, uh, you know, when I do my productivity tips webinars with Tom Duff, and people are, and we just think of it as this, you know, this has been out for a year and it's a cool little thing and I think yeah. I'll share this. And people are like, oh my gosh, that changes my world. Yeah. Like, exactly. wow. Okay. But, but even, even techies like us say that, Christian, yeah. that's the difference right. is that we, yep. we, we kind of like think it's only some people that benefit and it's not. Right. A lot of people are missing things that can really help their lives. Yeah, I, I always say with those productivity tips, if I can just change one life, that's all I want to do is change one yeah. life each month and then measure that so I can, you know, that's report cool. on that. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be pretty cool. I must yeah. Admit, yeah. So question four, what do you consider the greatest barrier to user adoption of cloud technologies? Um, I've always, and I didn't even answer it there, but there's a, there's like, obviously, I mean, I've spoken at many conferences about this and done many blog articles and that uh, greatest barrier to user adoption. I've always said is the PC that stands right in front of the user, whether it's connected or not. It's got nothing to do with the apps that it connects to or the servers or cloud technologies. It's, it's that PC that stops everything and their ability to be efficient on that PC because that's their gateway into everything. And if there's a blocker on the PC that they use every day, then whatever they reach out to and that's extended and more advanced is going to be a challenge. So that's one of the things, again, brings me back to PC literacy and, and digital literacy. PC literacy is the first step and then like making it bigger into digital literacy. The second thing um, that like is an unbelievable frustration for me. I get so mad about this. I cannot believe, and I hope people watch this and they get mad at me. I cannot believe that sea levels sit in boardrooms and sign off their fancy little Mont Blanc pens on millions of budgets for new technology and then they turn around and they don't use it. You need to use technology and lead by example. You're yep. just being a manager. We don't need managers, we need leaders. So people will not adopt technologies if their leaders and their managers don't, um, don't use that as well and show that it helps them be more efficient. So I'm so tired of that, of I, managers I, not using the technology. I just posted last night an article on getting a sea level uh, buy-in. And it's, and it's not about, you know, hey, sign the check so I could go buy the technology. It's about buy into okay. what I'm actually doing this, again, digital transformation, this business process improvement, understand what it is and, and agree with me and provide feedback so we can refine this and make yeah. it better. Uh, don't just sign a dumb, a dumb check. I don't want dumb money. Just I, I, I yeah. want to actually improve how we're doing business. I, yeah. The only thing I would throw into this question about the greatest barrier to user adoption, somebody mentioned connectivity. Um, and share yeah. the numbers of global access to the internet. I mean, that continues to be, I think, something for our yeah. time of getting the world connected and making sure that, it, you know, they're, they're not having our old uh, 34K modem uh, type experience, that it's a, uh, a, a fast connection. Uh, yeah. you know, but, but I think that, that continues to be, uh, in some parts of the world, uh, a, a barrier to adoption as well. I, I just want to add something to that because you know what we all want that magic pill and it's so it's so easy to grab and say oh my network you know because it becomes an excuse as well so for those who doesn't know, know me Tracy sitting in Pretoria right now in South Africa and um, and the previous uh, so believe it or not tomorrow is eight years since my business is registered so the previous approximately seven and a half years because it's been about a half a year maybe that I've got five in, so the previous years, um, I had to upload and download um, average speed of um, between 0.5 and 1. And I did webinars and I recorded videos and I did Teams calls. So, so uh, terrible though, and I, I buffered and it was horrible sometimes and it would cut out. But, but sometimes we've got to also accept where we are. And if we inform users enough of what to do when something doesn't work well, 
or how to get over that or hey did you know maybe just switch your audio or your video off because then um, the lines a bit better um but my, most users don't even know that so we've got to also be very careful because some of you guys are sharing stats for your down and upload speeds which are a thousand times faster than the speeds i used to work on so that's how scary it is um but it can be done if you inform people well enough and you give them enough information and tools they can work around it so we've got to be very careful that that doesn't become a thing as well because it that, that I've, I'm the perfect proof to show you that you can work on some of the worst networks, but you do need network. You right. can't go without. Well, mm -hmm. and thankfully, I mean, the technology continues to improve and, and the edge devices and edge services and other things yeah. are, are going to really help improve. And that's why you have like, you know, huge uh, portions of, of Africa that where the mobile networks are faster than any kind of regular plug into the wall internet service. Uh, and, and so the, the mobile technologies have gotten so much better as well. So question five, do the technologies we use today support or promote digital literacy and what can be improved? So I think that kind of like in the beginning of my little bandwagon that I jumped on for digital literacy, I had this uh, epiphany one day and I, of course it wasn't that amazing i just didn't realize it before is that uh, that eight pillars that uh, that uh, infographic that i always share is um i took those eight pillars and just to give you an idea quick so it's curation of content collaboration creativity um social and something something <laughs> um communication etc i can't remember now yeah whatever and I realized that if I took all the Office 365 apps, but not just Office 365, Microsoft 365, Azure, um, all of those, I could take each of those little icons and I could align it to some of those and they also duplicate it. So in a way, let's take PowerPoint, for example. PowerPoint helps me be more creative. It helps me curate content. It helps me create content. And these days with co-authoring, I can collaborate and things on those as well. So Office 365 definitely became tools that I use to build digital literacy on. Um, I do think that the challenge is the one feeds off the other one. So without a little bit of digital literacy, you're not going to adopt Office 365, and then Office 365 can't help you be better at digital literacy. So again, that brings me back to the PC literacy basics. I think if the PC literacy basics is in place, then Office 365 brings the level in which be, makes me digitally literate, if that makes sense. So it definitely does. And so question six was, uh, how is the importance of digital literacy changing during these unprecedented times? And <laughs> quite a few comments that were on there, and I know you talked a little bit about it. Go for it. No, I, I'm just going to say that, uh, uh, you know, I mean, obviously it's, it's forcing a lot of organizations that have been, uh, you know, culturally uh, uh, unwilling to to look at this issue. I mean, I it's it's funny. I was talking uh, last night to to somebody who was said, "Look, I've been involved with collaboration technology since the late 1990s, and I was in the IBM space. I worked in the 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 product lifecycle management, product data management, PLM, PDM space, and project portfolio management as that wing of collaboration." which is how I found my way into SharePoint and Office 365 was through these PLM, PDM, and project management technologies. Yeah. With all of those things, all of those companies uh, refused to let people work from home. It was mm -hmm. crazy. We're building technology to allow, to empower remote workers, and yet those companies largely would not let us work from home. And... And how, how many, I mean, you hear this constantly or heard prior to the COVID-19 quarantines, global quarantine. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so this, I have to believe when we get through this, because we will get through this, that it will well, have a permanent impact on those organizations. It's because it's not like we just rebound back to where we were. Uh, the organizations will still have to think about how do we keep the social distancing? Do we need to have people on site? Do we need yeah. to send people to these in-person events? Yes, some of that still needs to happen, yeah. but we're gonna do all of those things more differently. And I always think it also about organizations, there's so many over the last few years that have slowly moved people to remote 
because their roles can be done remotely and it then drives down yeah. a lot of those operational costs, a lot of the facilities costs. And so it, it is a more efficient, definitely- it can be a more effective way to do business for a lot of companies. I am, um, man, a person's always got to be careful when you say in my country, because I'm pretty sure it happens everywhere. You know, it's uh, something I'm very sad for the last couple of weeks. I've seen a lot of companies send people home without pay. I've seen companies send people home and take their leave. So even though South Africa is on a 21 day, like super bad, hectic lockdown, I can't even go for a walk. I wish I had a dog, which I still couldn't take for a walk, by the way. I have to say so, that's the um, upside to this whole thing is that here in the, like the Humane Society, and the, like dogs and there's a dog and cat shortage. People went in knowing they'd be <laughs> locked in and went and, and adopted pets, which is really cool. Oh, really? Well, see, we're not even allowed to. So they have fines out already. You're only allowed to go to the shop and buy essentials and come back. We're not even allowed to walk around in our complex. Hmm. So, um, but anyway, besides the point is that um, companies are sending people home. Um, they're taking their leave. Some of them are reducing their salaries. Those people can work from home. The company's culture is just not ready for it. Yeah. So there's a lot of those yeah. people who can physically continue working from home because it's not like the company completely stops. Um, but they're just not trusting them. A lot of companies are not trusting people to work from home. And you're right, this is going to have a massive impact on them. But uh, but how digital literacy, I mean, this is just an example again. Here's a very so silly example to think about. So here's me. I'm working from home for the first time in my office at work. I had a big extra screen, right? So I'd have my um, little laptop that I plug in there. And uh, I've got my apps that just stays in the right places all the time. You know, IT set it up once. Excel's always there on the big screen. And my emails are always there on the small screen. And now I get home and I've got one screen. You know that now most people don't even use alt tab to toggle between screens. Most people don't even know they can use Windows arrow to split screens. You know how frustrating that is for them? Because yeah. suddenly yeah. they think that they're limited because they don't have the extra screen because they never had the basics. And that's how digital literacy is going to impact this is people are going to be slower um, because it is different to work remotely. You have to learn. You know this. We've done this for years, though. So we've learned to work on airplanes and, I don't know, <laughs> off our laps. But it's different, so it's going to have a massive impact. I uh, agreed. It's uh, it, it, you know, I, both of those things, alt tabbing, and then the uh, the the Windows arrow, you know, splitting my screen. Things that I use on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. Like I was salivating over somebody sent a picture of one of those extra wide, like you get oh. three full, you know, uh, apps open on this extra wide screen. I'm like, I need two or three of those. No. <laughs> Yeah. I've, I've got, I don't have the extra wide one, but the screen that I'm looking at right now is big enough to do uh, three apps next to each other, like a little bit narrower, but three. And then there I've got a screen that goes two, and there I've got a computer that I can have a single screen. So I can at any time have six screens pretty much. Yep. But, uh, but again, people need to learn how to, I mean, I, I walk past people in offices, uh, Christian, and they'll have the same stuff open on both screens. And I'll say, why are you doing that? I'm going to take your screen away and give it to the car guard. Right. Or right. maybe you make the tea because what a waste. But IT has never shown them. They've never shown them how to split screens. They, I'm saying IT. I don't just mean right. to blame IT. I just mean we assume. So we've given someone a computer screen now and they just plug it in every day and there's big Excel and there's small Excel. That's what happens. And it's unfair because uh, we assume. And then we laugh at them. We go like, oh. Poor Mary in HR, you know, she doesn't know how to split screens. I'm like, you're right. Like any of us got born with that skill, but anyway. Yeah. Well, the final question, Tracy. So for organizations building their digital literacy, literacy strategies, what three things should they consider? So um, training, training, training. <laughs> but um, so the first thing is, is that you need a dedicated, a dedicated team for this. This whole thing, like where you walk into IT and say, hey, Peter, can you like just spend 10 minutes a day and make sure that that stuff happens? Doesn't work like that. I mean, you've got to have a dedicated person or team of people that, that looks after digital literacy, that looks after change management, that looks after training. It can't be an afterthought anymore. I just, I, I don't understand why it's not being taken serious. Um, then everyone should have basic training. I'm sorry, it's compulsory. I don't care. I don't care what companies are getting credible results because I force it. 
I don't care. And then um, you have to document and uh, communicate your digital strategy. And that doesn't happen in most of the companies that I get involved in. So they've decided to go cloud. They've decided to this. No one knows. They think it's poor Peter in IT's new little project because he plays golf with someone who sells Microsoft because that's what everyone thinks. They don't understand that the technology supports the company's uh, digital and uh, strategic objectives. So, so that doesn't get communicated. I think those, uh, those three things are very important for me. Well, two, two things that I would add on to that, and I, and I know you agree with both these things. I think uh, to uh, writing on the back of that, uh, the communication strategy, if, you, if the leadership team makes that kind of reporting of that information, because there's data points, there's things that you can go and monitor and measure around that activity, around adoption and engagement, and how many people have completed the training. Um, you can do skills assessments around certain basic things. Um, I, I'm, an, yeah. I'm a big fan of, of doing kind of the mixed media of certain amount of, uh, you know, on-demand training, in-person training, uh, Friday uh, lunch and learns where people are sharing what they've developed and you know built out on their own and, and and kind of build that level of advocacy and evangelism inside of an organization of people that are helping each other mm-hmm. and you can so measure all of those things talk about those make that part of the discussion that the leadership team has yeah. the other thing i would throw on that is from the on the technology side is having a strong change management methodology in place is so critical because yeah. this technology is rapidly evolving, innovating, new things that are coming out weekly, sometimes several times a week. Yeah. We're, we're struggling to keep up sometimes. And what is this thing? Or we hear about something months in advance, but don't see it reach our tenant yeah. until months later. And we've forgotten about it. And what is this thing? And, and yeah. what do I need to tell my end users and, and all those kinds yeah. of things? So having a, a, that change management methodology, just have that again, part of your culture is going to be critical because organizations that are able to adapt uh, quickly to change are going to have a distinct competitive advantage yeah. over those that can't change. Absolutely. I think I'd like to definitely add some as well there. And because I take the change management science so serious, I mean, it was have you got any idea how many times I've walked into meetings where people say, Trey, so, so you can add the fluffy stuff for us? And I'm like, <laughs> fluffy stuff. I'm like, I don't get that. But anyway, but look at the fluffy stuff now. Now everyone wants the fluffy stuff, don't they? Right. But um, the productivity score, um, it is still in preview. Um, it's an unbelievable tool to help people that are new to this to, uh, to kind of see what um what the measurements are how people are collaborating and things like that and then also it gives you kind of some actions and some reading mats on how to correct that so i think that's a pretty cool tool and i also think very important to get your facts straight there's a big difference between consumption and adoption so watching those dashboards and saying oh 95 percent of my users are on one drive that means nothing that's like um, talking about everyone in the world that has driver's licenses that should not be driving. Okay, so please don't make that mistake. Make very sure that you track and measure the right things. And like you said, um, also the methodology is very important, but we've got to be very careful. Um, people shouldn't just be change management methodologies. I want those people to be experts on Office 365. Those things have become merged for me. It can't be separate roles anymore. You can't just be a change management person anymore if you don't understand the technology. So that's that's a personal opinion, but I'll stick to it. Right. Well, and, and one other thing just made me think too um, uh, is the, um, I'm scrolling down to find it here. Uh, if I had it, uh, must be a, a ways back, um, but is, uh, yeah, is going and building out a, a portal of these resources. Microsoft has is, is been so Absolutely. great about creating a lot of these training resources. And so to go and actually uh, create, have like a, you know, a, if you have SharePoint, if you have an intranet in place and building a communication site out with a lot of these assets. Yeah. I mean, I'm a big fan of, you know, in-context training and content, uh, you know, so it's relevant to what you're doing, where you are within the environment. Um, and people are more likely to read through that, you know, when they're we're looking for it. Like I was joking, somebody said, does it anybody read the manuals anymore? And I responded and said, I never, I, read, I never read the manuals. I go search for YouTube tutorials, you know? Yeah. And uh, I mean, that's the, rea- the reality is that you need to serve up content that makes the different, you know, information consumption models. And Microsoft, yeah. 
when you're talking about Microsoft technology, Microsoft is doing a great job at producing content yeah. um, to help support the adoption and training. Yeah. So, um, so I think a last one, and maybe you can throw a resource in there. Maybe you can just go and look at it. Microsoft, I don't know how long ago, um, they've had a digital literacy course for quite a couple of years and it got quite outdated and I see they've made some changes to it. So that might be, again, I haven't gone through it to say that, oh, it's hundreds or it will work or it won't work, but um, there's amazing resources out there that can help people. And uh, the, if you go and search for the Microsoft uh, the adoption resources as well. But it's so that's my... That, that's the learning pathways is the site, yeah, the site collection that you can deploy. And then of course you can go and add the adoption resources to that. Have you seen that Microsoft Teams flipbook? I mean, that thing yeah. is so sexy. I promise that thing is so sexy. It's unbelievable. I add them as tabs on my teams and things. So people, there's an unbelievable amount of resources out there. It's just about bringing it all together. I think many people, and it makes me mad. Okay. Many people will sit back and say, why is Microsoft not like spoon feeding us with what we need to know? And I'm like, look at you next week. You're going to go out fighting again because you don't have a choice. And now you want the choice. I, you know, they're going to give you the tools. You've got to make it work for you. But all that stuff's out there. Unbelievable resources. So, There's tons yeah. of it out there. Well, Tracy, really appreciate your time today and, and help us summarize this. Uh, it, it's fun. It's amazing for those that haven't participated in one of the collab talk tweet jams is that, so this is just two people sitting and talking about these seven questions. We had like yeah. 50 people on there, hundreds of tweets that went by. We generally, yeah. we, we usually have like two or three million impressions in the one hour yeah. sessions that we have. Just uh, so, yeah, I'm also going to go back through and what other people commented on and follow links and things that people shared and reach out for follow-up yeah. questions. So thank you so much for your time today or this evening for you. And, uh, We'll catch you on the next one. Thanks so much, Christian. I really enjoyed. Talk to you later.